age of five. Okay? And I'll start with Brother Jalil, who is on my right. And uh, each one of you, inshallah, before speaking, if you can say your name and mention how long you've been Muslim and what country you're from. Okay? Name, how long you've been Muslim, what country you're from. And inshallah, we begin with that question in regards to the explanation of their environment from zero to five years old. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu wa ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Jalil Navarro, and I'm from Monterey, Mexico. It's a small city uh, near the border. Uh, I'm years old, and I have I embraced uh, March 2013, which is gonna be years next month. So for zero, you say zero yeah, five years. Early childhood. How was your household? How did that look? Um, you know, uh, I grew up in a in a broken family. I, my dad uh, raised my, me and my and my sister. My parents, um, there were there were always like problems in my house. So I don't want to say <coughs> that my mom had the, the the fault of that, but but we ended up uh, living with my dad uh, till the till. Five Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Jose, uh, and I'm 31 years old. Uh, I born in um, Leon, Guanajuato, Mexico City, and I embrace Islam. Go. Uh, the environment from when I was one until five, I was not the best but not a word. Uh, we had a lot of needs, but we were a happy family with a lot of needs, but family, happy. Did you have family? What family was your environment? Uh, seven uh, brothers and a mom. And uh, my dad, he was absent. He, w he was not there with us. But we were happy one way or another. Uh, so my name is Antonio Castillo Papaleo. Uh, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, I've been in about two years in Tresan, around uh, 2012. So uh, zero to five. Uh, my dad, he was uh, when I was born. My dad was uh, just finishing residency. Uh, he's a doctor. So not much, obviously, pretty busy. Um, my mom was really the one that really kept us, like, just raising us. Because um, I was born here, because again, he was finishing up res a residency here. But I really r I was raised in Puerto Rico because we ended up moving there right around the time that I was five. So overall, I mean, it was just me, my mom, and my sister, or actually me and my mom at that time. And uh, it was pretty peaceful. I, I can't say I remember much when I was, uh, you know, one, two, or three. So that's really the most I can say. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Hassan Castro. I'm from Colombia. I'm born in a city named Buenaventura. It's in the Pacific, Colombia. Uh, I've been in Islam since 1997, almost 18 years. I remember from one to five, I live with my parents, you know, my father and mother. And we have a happy family, even though we were from the middle class people. We, my parents were there for me. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. People, you up? <laughs> my turn. Rahman and Rahim. As you can tell, I'm from somewhere else outside the United States. I was born in Colombia. The brother was born in a city called Buenaventura. At the age of five, I must say that. Uh, pretty much uh, was raised by my mother, my father and my mother. Uh, they decided to separate, and I was one of the um, taken to one of the best barrios, best uh, ghettos uh, in my hometown called El If you Google El Gueras, you will be able to see it. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> As you know, the things that you get to hear. TV and outlets, yeah. 
uh, even though that we were in an environment that was kind of like pretty violent, uh, still with the love of my mother at least was there. I was uh, one among seven, and she was pretty much doing this by herself. So, uh, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, nobody got hurt. It was good. It was good. Thank you. We all have insurance. Yes. That's right. <laughs> There's insurance in this issue. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, Alhamdulillah. So to my left, inshallah, we continue. Yes. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Your brother uh, Danny Abdullah Hernandez. I uh, accepted Islam uh, over three years. Alhamdulillah. I actually, at the age of five, I was living in Brooklyn, DMC, and seeing the break dancing in front of my house, buying my first Nikes from a candy store. Right, and um, that was it. Seeing sometimes out the window somebody get shot or a friend get hit by a car, things like that. So Brooklyn during those times were very tough. It got better now, but that's basically my early childhood. And my family, uh, I'm originally from, uh, I'm New Yorican, right? I'm born in New York. My family's from Puerto Rico. And uh, alhamdulillah, my parents ha have been married ever since. Uh, before that, before they got married, actually, my mother was a nun. And she found some questions that weren't answered in the convent, that she chose to leave the convent and got married with me. So alhamdulillah, she uh, raises up well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. My name is Isa Parada. My parents are from El Salvador, uh, Central America. Uh, I grew up in uh, New York. Uh, my parents <coughs> were uh, with me, with my older sister and my grandmother. Um, alhamdulillah, my mother was the one who was the spiritual uh, guide for the family, always encourages, encouraging us to go to church. I was going to Catholic school at the time uh, as a young child, of, up to the, starting at the age of four. My older sister was very active in the Catholic school. My father was more on the political uh, socialist route, Fidel Castro and things like that. So I was also aware, even at a young age, the political uh, talk that he used to have with uh, brothers and friends. And how long have you been Muslim? Uh, I've been Muslim since October of 1996. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah. Um, my name is Abdullah. I am from Colombia as well, but I'm from a town called Florencia. It's towards um, the Amazon. Um, I have been a Muslim for. Alhamdulillah. Um, I come from a town. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, my family. Uh, my mom, she's a single parent. I didn't meet my father until I was 20 something. I grew up in my grandmother's house, and um, it was my mother, my grandmother, because that was her house, and I grew up with about five or six uncles until about uh, five, I think, years later. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wait one more time because I said that wrong. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry. Um, my name is Sandra Saenz. I'm from Monterrey, Mexico. I've been a Muslim for four years. My childhood was awesome. I had no problem. Um, it sounded awesome because my mother made it sound awesome. Uh, my father actually was a drug dealer, a big drug dealer in Mexico, and he got shot by his best friend. But I never knew that until I was about 14 years old, 15 years old. Um, I really had a great childhood. My mom never, ever said anything wrong, like I said, about my father. So I grew up pretty fine. I didn't know my dad's um, side of the family due to the different issues that were going on. But basically, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I just hung out with my mom's um, side. 
sorry, I'm looking, I'm like, I have ADD, so I'm like, what is going on? So, um, so I've been a Muslim for four years, and it's, it's been great. But my childhood, like I said, was pretty fine, except for that little part about my dad not being the best person out there. Okay. Uh, alaikum. My name is Julia Montiel. Um, I'd like to thank you guys very much and the um, ICI for inviting me here. Uh, it's very much a pleasure to be here. A little bit about how I converted. Um, I am a recent convert. I converted in September of 2015. And um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I grew up Catholic. My parents, I live with both of my parents. Uh, well, I was raised in a very loving home, uh, th but there was just always something missing in my life, and I was very active in the church. I was part of the youth group. I helped in the mass, but there was always this long, this empty feeling that I had. And, um, Jazakallah like hair. Thank you. Okay, so why is this important to start at this age? You know, many of, the, many of us don't realize how important this age is, okay? When you look at early child psychology, right, people will determine that you have made up your construct of life and pretty much established the, the very foundation of how you will have an outlook on life, okay? By at the latest, by the age of six. Some say even by the age of three. So the environment that you grew up in the experiences that you have, whatever you lack or whatever you have plenty of, it all molds the way you will see life. Now the next period of life that we want to look at is going to be a period of life that human beings usually go through a lot of changes, which is from around that time when we're, mashallah, very innocent, you know, let's say till five, it pretty much almost becomes the same until you hit possibly close to like 10 years old and then you go until like 20. That next period of your life, you're going to make a lot of changes, okay? And because of the lack of time, I would even expect a bit more so that we go around three times. We made one round, we're going to go three rounds, okay? The next period of the life, we just want to mention from around that adolescent age, around 10, okay? To possibly, okay, for many of us who've actually passed on to 30 years old, some of the people here haven't gone there. But let's say from about 10 to 30. And if any of you became Muslim in that time, you don't have to share that story. You just focus on the time mainly when you were a teenager. There are serious changes that happen. And I hope, inshallah, each and every one of us can be very open, honest in regards to these sort of things that happen. So we start, inshallah, with Brother Jalil. Uh, so from having a, a childhood and all that, let's move on to how that age change of you know childhood to adulthood almost in the teenage years what happened at that point in time i must have been teenagers mostly teenage yeah me mostly teenage oh. okay how i said um uh i was living with my dad and my my brother and 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 i and actually at this time around 10 12 13 years old, uh, my dad got the custody for my sister. Um, I remember that I was uh, I was like another kid. I was going to school. Um, I was taking care of my sister, and my dad was taking care. Of my sister. Um, something that I want to emphasize is that, that my dad, you know, he was he was raising us. He was taking care of us, so he wa he he had to work uh, more than than regular. Uh, he was doing laundry, he was cooking for us, he was cleaning the house, he was doing iron and, you know, lunch for school, everything, uh, until the point that he taught us how to, for us, in order to, to do it for my sister. So, um, for my dad, 
he didn't want us to to be just alone because we were kids you know so he he put us in a karate academy so i started to practice karate i was you know in the sports and and school and i think that happened excuse me después un cambio cuando pasó todo esto la problemática de sus años antes de la edad de mira okay uh uh, you know, I think I was I was I was looking for for what I didn't have uh, in my house, so I was looking maybe for for the love of a mother or something. I was looking for those little things outside in the streets. Uh, even though I was I was uh, good at school, I studied high school, then I went to university. I was playing uh, American football, uh, but at the same time, you know, um, the friends. I think the friends and the environment where you live. You don't see uh, the society that, are, that is around you. I think it has a, um, um, a ver it's very, very to you. You don't think that you're doing something wrong, but you ended up uh, drinking and, and doing drugs and being in parties and and all these these things. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Okay, uh, uh, once I start the second stage, um, I was about 13 when I decided to move out from my parents' house. I went to a different state, and then I guess I, uh, I was lost. I did all the wrong in the world, all of it. And I did that for many years until the big change happened. And the big change was embrace Islam. Before that, I didn't care about anything or anybody. Could you, without, with not being connected to the legal system here, but couldn't you mention a few things that were happening at that time? Well, I had no guidance. Uh, a spiritual or guidance from my parents. So I was living uh, a tough life, hassling, doing all the wrong that you can think of. Maybe putting a pistol in someone's head and stuff like that. And uh, only, I don't know why, I live this far. Now I know that God has a purpose for me, but I didn't know back then. I didn't know back then. All right, so uh, like I left off around the age of five, moved to Puerto Rico. Uh, between the age of five and nine, there, and that's when I really got into my Catholic faith. I came from Catholicism. Um, you know, uh, my grandma is probably one of the most religious people in my entire family. I mean, they ha she has, like, Jesus statues in every single corner. So, you know, have, uh, having that sort of, like, uh, in, uh, being in that sort of environment, you know, I kind of had a lot of questions, you know. One of the most, uh, uh, with uh, Puerto Ricans anyway, being over there, uh, if something bad would happen, you know, they would kind of, uh, instead of yelling, like, God's name, it would go, like, oh, St. Paul. You know, like, why did this happen? So, obviously, that, right off the bat, I was kind of questioning. I was like, uh, what happened to God? What happened to Jesus? Um, so, you know, you know, I started getting further and further away. Um, even though I was still young, uh, I still actually thought at that level, surprisingly. Um, at the age of nine, uh, kind of borderline ten, that's when I moved back to Texas. Um, you know, that's, I felt totally uncomfortable being back totally weird but uh being in catholic school because once i came back to te uh, texas my mom actually put me in catholic school you know i i got more into my faith and they kind of kind of settled me a little bit because it reminded me a little bit of puerto rico um so i was i was okay uh probably until i left the entire catholic school system at the age of 13 when i entered a uh, public charter school that's when i saw many more faiths i had a very narrow view the entire world was catholic uh, so, you know, seeing all these faiths, you know, I was kind of second-guessing myself. It's like, 
there are so many, so which one's the one? So I kind of just left it at that. I became more agnostic than anything else at the age of 13 till, till probably I embraced Islam at 18. Probably until then I've been agnostic. At the age of, I say, six, my father, he moved at the house, not because of, he and my mama still, they were still married, but uh, for reason of, of work, they transferred to another city, so we were living with my mom. He used to come around only like, you know, vacation time. And uh, about a year after he moved out, my mama was killed by a drunk driver. I witnessed the hour with my mother when she lost her life. And after that, my life just a lot of change came to my life. My daddy came back to stay with us, but uh, due to the fact that we have been used to my mama way, we don't get along with my daddy anymore. So he tell us that we were to we were still cheers because I was like um, probably between eight or nine. The other sister she was like sixteen, so we told my daddy that we will be alright. He can't go back where he was. He has still support so financially he was still taking us, so we were living together. And he helped us to build a uh, strong bond among me and my brother. We helped him share out, look after each other. And like in 86, about two, three years later, I got uh, my wife, she was living here in the United States. Same thing happened to him. He was uh, intoxicated, playing with a gun. He killed his best friend. After that happened, a friend of mine killed somebody, same way my mama got killed. He was drunk driving a motorcycle. He ran over this lady, killed this lady, same way my mama got killed. So after that, school, from 18 years old, I dropped out of school. I started hanging around the wrong people, taking bad decisions on my life. Cause really, I had nobody around me to tell me what to do or give me any advice. I used to be a man on my own. Since I was probably 13, I was taking my own decisions. Most of them were bad, some were good, but uh, that's how it was. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, I still not remember the age of 13. <coughs> I pretty much at the age of I uh, signed my, put my side in uh, the doctor's daughter, which pretty much creates a lot of chaos. The, 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 that was my first wife. Eventually, I ended up but being that I was a person who was not of the same status, that creates a lot of issues with uh, my uh, at that time, uh, father-in-law. Helping my mother, so of course I was not going to school anymore. I was involved in a lot of uh, activities that were taking place back then, which was contraband. They used to come from Panama. They have a free zone. They bring uh, products from China. And what they used to do back then, they used to make that go into a country in a legal way. So at the age of 13, pretty much, I used to sometimes confrontations with cops, uh, shootouts. As you see, in even the real life. And then, uh, of course, um, as everybody needs a hero. At the age of 13, 14, pretty much uh, some movies come out that inspire some of the people who came to this country to do um, not so good stuff. As Colombians, as you know, we are known for coffee and some other stuff too, no? Yes, okay. So you can imagine. Um, that was one of my aspirations today. You might say 13, 14. And pretty much, probably the brother will come over and tell you the continuation of that, inshallah. Okay, okay. never mind. Diego. Okay, <clears throat> you know, for for this side, okay, just some points for you to consider, inshallah, just so that you don't um, lose the story narrative. Okay, they e each one of the people in general but you know mashallah these people here on this panel have the courage to talk about certain things there's a moment in time if you're not Muslim where you have to make decisions and all of a sudden you feel that the you're in and the people that you think are supposed to help you with those decisions and those are the times that some decisions are made that later on you realize were not so good decisions at the point in time when these decisions are made, you never know the repercussion of those things. It's just beginning to get 
you heard a little bit of things, but it comes to a tipping point where it's almost life or death for many of us. Many of us. And inshallah, if you stick around, you'll see in the next round how Islam was that choice that actually saved our lives for a good, a good amount of us. So inshallah, stick, stay tuned with that. And we'll start with the sisters, inshallah, and come back around. Uh, you made a really good point there. Um, during that age, our, our minds are not mature to understand the consequences of our actions. We're very quick to make decisions and not think about them afterwards. I myself made a lot of decisions during those teenage years that upset my parents, uh, upset the law, and myself too. Uh, you get involved with the wrong kind of people, and it's very true. We have a saying, I know it's an Arabic saying, but also in, in um, our Hispanic saying that, tell me who you're with and I'll tell you who you are. Uh, we get involved with people that are not in our best interest. Um, but we do find, we have that climactic moment where we realize we're alone, looking for someone. But then we realize Allah is always there for us. And that's when we turn to him. We return to him. Um, he was always there, and um, I know in my life I've made decisions, that, but I realize that Allah was always there. This dunya is very deceiving. The love for this dunya is very deceiving, but the love of Allah is, is a true guidance, and that's what made me turn to Islam. So I was an only child, and I say was because found out that I actually had two brothers. I found out through Facebook, which was not the best way. Um, I, I was an only child, and when you're an only child, you're pretty lonely. I don't want to cry, but I'm very sensitive about it. I swear I'm not a crier. <laughs> um, my mom was a single mom because my dad died when he was five. I mean, when I was five, not when he was five. I wouldn't be born if he died when he was five. Um, so my, my dad passed away because he was shot in the face by his compadre, which we would translate that to... Comrade? Yeah, some, something of that sort. So, yeah, like my, my dad's best friend, basically. Um, and it was over a drug deal. Um, my dad used to transport in, a, in an airplane cocaine. Um, so he got shot through a deal. My mom never mentioned anything, like I said. It hurts now because just looking at all the moms up there, all of you ladies that are moms, that you know that you said probably little white lies here and there to tweak it. And by the way, that lady waving over there, she helped me convert actually four years ago. <laughs> I'm like, um, um, Sorry. Anyways, so long story short, uh, you know, I, I was, I, now that I think about it, it's sad, but, you know, having my childhood, it was pretty great. I really thought that there were unicorns and pink elephants, and that's just the world that my mom, you know, taught me. She didn't, she didn't let me see anything great, even though my life was pretty great, and her life was pretty great. Um, because I was an only child, I always, always was obsessed with stuff I couldn't figure out. Um, and I'm, I'm also uh, coming from a Catholic background. My grandma was very Catholic, very involved in the church. She used to um, always have the Bible everywhere. She'll just have it everywhere. She'll have like five Bibles all over the house. And I remember I grabbed it one day, and I was just a very strange kid because I used to always want to read the apocalypse for some reason. I wanted to read the scary and it just intrigued me. Thank you. <laughs> and it just intrigued me, and it just really wanted me. I, I don't know. It just there was something about it. Th there was something that, that caught my eye. I wanted to be that person that figured out the six 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 of the Bible. I wanted to figure out how I can decode, you know, and save this world from all the evil. That I, I and I was fourteen or probably nine or something. Um, so I always read it, and I would never forget, um, I was about nine years old, 
I read the apocalypse. I walked to a church because, of course, my mom was not home. She was working. And I remember I, I got into that church, and the first thing when you do in the Catholic church is you kneel down and you do like a thing symbol. You do like a cross. And I remember, please, just... I want to be that last one person that before the day of judgment comes, I want to be taken because you they tell you to be taken, and you know, the, you know you're gonna go to heaven and the good people will be, you know, like I said, go to heaven. So I I used to pray all the time. Can I be that before the earth disintegrates? Can I be that one last person? Can I just be saved? Can I just be that favorite child of yours that you one day? And subhanAllah, I became a Muslim. Um, it's just, I never cry saying the story, uh, but now that I'm thinking about it, it just makes so much sense why I converted. But long story short, um, I, I was that curious kid. Always wanted to know about God and know about God and know about God. But I never prayed to God. I never um, prayed to anything until I realized that my dad was a bad guy. My grandma told me to pray for my dad because if I prayed for him, there was something called purgatory. And in the purgatory, um, my dad would be there. It's, it's kind of like some level of Jannah, to put it that way. It was kind of like in the middle. And then you would go to actually to heaven. If you, the more you pray, the more you can get people out of there. It, looked like, it sounded like a get out of free jail card, what I'm talking about. So one, when I was 15 years old and I went to high school, May Allah bless this, this teacher I had. He was a history teacher, and I don't know why he just came one day and said, for all of you guys that believe in religion, I just, just, just hope you guys know that a lot of it is just a lie. Did you know that the purgatory is not real? And, I mean, everybody was shocked. We were all 14 years old. We don't know why he came saying that. Um, but at the end, he, he explained to us how in the Catholic Church, they, they call purgatory a place where you're kind of like in between, in between heaven and hell. It's kind of like a happy medium. So when he talked about the purgatory, he mentioned how uh, the purgatory was, uh, was actually made by monarchy and the church because a lot of the soldiers didn't want to because they would kill people. And killing people was one of the sins that you couldn't do. So nobody wanted to go to war. So what ended up happening was that they made a contract called the purgatory. So any time that a would die in war, they would give it to the wife. And then that meant that they were at a place where they could pray for him and go to heaven. So that's what our teacher told us. So whenever that, they told me that, my whole world was shattered. I've been reading the Bible. I thought I was going to be that special person that was going to be raptured or some of that sort. So that was where my childhood was, was at 14. Um, at the age of five until I was eight years old, um, I was actually very happy, alhamdulillah. Uh, those are my happiest memories. At the age of eight, my mom became, um, got married to a man from Bogota. Um, things changed in my life. I no longer lived with my grandmother. I lived with my mother and her husband. Um, we lived there in Florencia until I was 13 years old. Uh, it was a very difficult childhood for me after the age of eight. Um, I used to get uh, scolded and uh, punished uh, very harshly. At uh, the age of 13, we had to leave Colombia. I don't know if you guys know what's going on, here, but uh, sometimes people have political persecution. So because we wanted to stay alive, we fled Colombia and we went to Ecuador. Um, in, in, when I was 12, 13, that's when I started drinking. Um, sorry. At the age of uh, 12 and 13, that's when I started drinking. We used to drink half a bo half a beer. Then I went to Ecuador, to Quito, Ecuador, and I started a school in which people used to smoke marijuana. Uh, classmates, 14, 15 years old, smoking marijuana, drinking bottles of beer this high. And um, I used to join them, you know. Uh, you don't have any family in Ecuador, they didn't have anybody, they didn't know anybody. I was very new there. So we used to hang out, drink, have a good time. You know, you're single, you're alone, you don't know anybody. Nobody wants to hang out with you, you don't have any friends, you don't have any family. Somebody gets close to you and they want to drink and have a good time with you, you're gonna say yes. It's logical. Um, I continued to be in that school until the end of the year. 
And then my mom realized what kind of people I was hanging out with. So she transferred me to a different school, to a private school. Um, I finished my uh, middle school and high school over there. Um, in, during that time, I, uh, I was crazy about women. Uh, you know, you get that age and, 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 you know, you don't have any friends. I didn't have any friends. It was very hard to make friends. I'm from Colombia. We are very outspoken, very happy people. Ecuadorians are very reserved very shy, contact and, and close to somebody. Uh, so I graduated high school at the age of 16. Um, at that age, I had encountered a few religions. I, I, I forgot to mention that in Colombia, I used to go to school. And it used to be run by nuns. And we used to have a mass on Fridays. And we used to study the, the Bible, the Old Testament. So I knew about Abraham, about Noah, about uh, Moses, Adam. Um, but it was all according to the Bible. Um, at 16, I graduated high school, and I went to law school. And um, I want to stop before I go into uh, for the details. Bismillah. <clears throat> so living in New York for myself, alhamdulillah, I was going to Catholic school. I was the altar boy. I was the one helping the priest. Uh, you know, as a young child, you know, carrying the cross for the priest and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, hanging with, we were into culture, uh, you know, wearing my Adidas with my thick laces, uh, you know, break dancing and things like that. But eventually my father wanted to move to Houston because it was a cheaper, you know, way cheaper to live. Uh, he thought that it was a better environment. But coming to New York when I was around uh, 11, 12 years old, what had happened, I, I realized it was completely different from New York where you have people from different races in your, your neighborhood. When you come to Houston, Southwest Houston, where me and Mujah grew up in, called A-Leaf, it was very segregated. It was very African-Americans with themselves, like themselves, and, it, and gangs at that time were coming up. I mean, you would have people from high school coming into our middle school with shotguns and their trench coats. And I'm thinking, like, what's going on? This environment is crazy. People calling me. Mexican, and I'm like, yo, I'm Salvadorian. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> so it was a lot of that tension amongst different races. Uh, the Prophet said is interesting that a lot of them mentioned uh, about friends. Uh, the Prophet said, Rajulu ala dini khalili, uh, liman yukhal. Right? The Prophet said, the religion of his close friend. So all of you watch out who you befriend. My parents raised me with good morals and values from Christianity. I mean, a lot of the morals and values are the same when it comes to Christianity and Islam. But I had morals and values to hang out with certain friends, either hanging out with them for, uh, after football practice or just hanging out with, uh, you know, the homeboys in the, in, the, in the corner, for lack of better words. And you'd be surprised and amazed, brothers and sisters, the amount of things that we see at, at that age. At 13, my mother would have never thought, nor my father, that my, that my neighbor's brother was a big-time drug dealer. And his sister was out of, the, out of town, and so were my parents. With my grandmother, I, we go, my, some of my boys, we go into the house, and we're offered to snort cocaine, and we're offered thousands of dollars and kilos of cocaine to sell near, uh, as some of them know, on Ranchester area, it's changed a lot with a lot of refugees. Place where you here I am, 13 years old, being offered these type of things. So that environment was around me for that time period, and not going too much detail. But at the same time, when I was 15 years old, my father went to prison, hanging out with the wrong crowd, and that's when I became a bitter person. I was angry. I was I hated police officers because they took my father to jail. I hated white people because it was white people who took my father to jail. And that anger and that, um, and that disease started growing into my heart. So my mother would always worry about me because I used to have a lowrider type of car. And she would always say, sell that car because you're either going to be hurt by a cop or you're going Well, as I started, 
you mentioned Adidas, and I also used to hear that Run DMC Adidas as well, so, so from New York. At the age of nine, my parents moved from Brooklyn to Puerto Rico. The first year when I was there, immediately when you, are, when you don't know the language well, uh, people begin to bother you, right? So there was began to uh, try to bully me. So I came from Brooklyn. He didn't know what was going to happen to him, but <laughs> so I make sure that uh, you know I made my uh, self known in the beginning in order to get that respect. I didn't like to bother. I didn't like to bully. I didn't like bullies. But I was taught to uh, be respected as well. So that same year, the first year of school, I was in fourth grade, I found a best friend. This best friend happened to be He went on a school trip to a, an, a park, I like SeaWorld, and he was missing. For days, he was missing. So finally they found pieces of his body, right? Uh, his finger, teeth, and they found them under the, he happened to be kidnapped, and they found them under the pool, uh, the filter. So the reason that I'm saying that is because you guys are small, right? And I was small. And sometimes you have experienced those kinds of hardships. So those things, those challenges and those hardships, if it doesn't have a it leads to a lot of bigger problems. If there's no counseling, it leads to a lot of bigger problems. So I didn't have no counseling. We just had to deal with it. So at the age of 10, me and my friends will sneak out of class or between classes and we would go to the store and, and steal a little Bacardi box around and drink. We didn't like it, it was nasty. But it was nice to talk about it, like we just got drunk. We come to class all messed up and the teachers really would give us a hard time. So these are the, the kind of things that took place at that age. When I was in Puerto Rico, my mother, my, my aunt, she always used to take care of foster, foster kids. So my mother decided to take care of one too. And my parents were very loving, always had the updated video games. My dad, when we were in Brooklyn, I think, honestly, it was uh, because my dad was, had more time to be involved, and we used to go play around, play in the parks, etc. But when we were in Puerto Rico, it was a little bit different, more spaced out. So my mother took care of this boy. He was a year older than me. And finally, they decided, when they saw that I was getting into trouble, to come back to the States. So he came back to... Excuse me. We came back to, um, to New Jersey, and the social services didn't let my mother bring our foster, my foster brother. This, this kid, when he came to my house, he wasn't right. Finally, he has love, stability. He was well-mannered. You know, he, he is because his, you know, the tarbiyah that was taking place, you know, my mom really took care of him without making distinction. He was like my brother. So they didn't let him come with us. So it was very hard and very hard for him. So a couple of years later, he happened to, you know, hang himself. So this is when the system doesn't want to give up someone who's benefiting or being cared for because they might lose the, the money that they get, you know, for having these people under foster care. But anyway, as well. So during that time, I also didn't have a follow-up. I also didn't have no counseling. I also didn't have no help. So I began to rebel. So every, from there on, every year I was in a new school. One time a cop came up to me and scratched me with a key. 
I was 12 years old. So I told my friend, you know, this, you know, not my mom, you mean my mom, she doesn't, you know, she respects us like that because she knows an, an honorable thing. So we ended up, my, my friend and I ended up beating up the cop. We <laughs> beat up the cop at the age of 12. We didn't mean to, but he scratched me with a key, you know, and this is not, I lost total respect for leadership because you don't do that to a kid. So now, these rebellious uh, years at the age of 10, you know, trying to find the best solution for us, move back to Puerto Rico at the age of 15. So that moving back and forth affected me to the point where in Puerto, in Puerto Rico at the age of 16, 15, you get your license. So once you get your license, you're lost. So Alhamdulillah, you know, I encounter a lot of those hardship, one, because of the music as well. We were following whatever the music was saying, and, just, and to find out that it, it's all planned, you know, the way they sing this music, want you to kill each other, want you to have fight, beef with each other, fight with each other, you know, for the sake of supporting uh, people going to prison. So basically, that was my influences. Okay, so to end it up, I want each and every person, inshallah, to talk about what Islam did for them or why basically choosing Islam was the best choice. Uh, to wrap up a lot of what the brothers and sisters mentioned, you know, at this age time, uh, there's a lot of turbulence. And I'll tell you, when I was 15 years old, my best friend actually, unfortunately, you know, shot himself because of the pressure he was going under. Uh, we've had a lot of different things happen in our life, but right now we want to give it, we want to give it the next twist, inshallah, okay? And we'll, we'll end in this last round. We if you did not find Islam where was your life at at that point in time you can talk about the most crucial thing that was happening at that time and then how Islam helped you you know transition or go beyond that okay so we want to be very brief because I know time already we have 10 minutes max inshallah to cut it off so we can end at 930 so if you did not know about Islam just think about the fact that how, where would you be, what would you have done, and what was that the crucial moment where you figured that something had to change and Islam was that answer? So let's try to get one minute each, because okay. ten of us. Right. Okay, I think uh, uh, at that time where, where all the turbulence, the, the, the climax in, in, in my life, I think the, the people that it was, uh, I was not hanging with uh, good people. Um, Ended up um, drug dealing uh, with my best friend. My best friend was in charge of the cocaine. I was in charge of the MDMA for for the city. We are from the same city, from Monterey. And and if you see Monterey in the map, it's a it's a city of drugs because it's in the north, two hours from the border, and it's a key point to to move on all the stuff, you know. So um, the karate that, that my dad was. Um, so go to here in America. When you're yes. in America already in Islam. Okay, I had to run out of my country because I got kidnapped uh, from the drug cartels. So I had to run. I had to le leave my country. So, uh, when I came here, I I decided to to you know like a self like a self uh, rehabilitation, but it was it was hard. No, no guidance. So I ended up doing you know bad stuff as well. Um, you know, and I think that the, the, the worst point of what to be one day gambling in Las Vegas, Nevada, I ended up looking for, for the pennies to, to buy a hamburger in McDonald's. I ended up having nothing, 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 neither money to go back to my country. So at that point, uh, I was about to kill myself. It's like a flashback. At that point, uh, um, I just didn't know where I was. I didn't know where I was. I felt like I was lost in, in this world. I felt like I was just, just walking like, like we say in Spanish, like but zombie. without zombie, yeah, like with no purpose. So one day I say, <clears throat> I just did, I didn't know that much about Islam, 
but I just, do, I just posturing my faith in the ground, and I said, the one that created the whole universe, you, the one that creates everything, the one that created me, you know me more than, than, than everything. So I just, I'm just, I cannot handle my life. I cannot do it anymore. It's, it's like I'm lost. If, if you don't take my life, I'm just going to take it myself. So what I did is I did that. I didn't know what was that. And I said, I give you my life. Just use it for your purpose because I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing. MashaAllah. And then soon after that, when did you find Islam after? Um, little by little, I think like 10 months after that, everything started to change. Uh, I was still, you know, bullying my friends, uh, encouraging them to, to go to clubs and eat pork, you know. Uh, but I saw that, that the, the beauty, I saw that, that they were good, you know. So it was a question for me, like, why these guys from Brazil, these guys from Morocco, these guys from Saudi Arabia, but how come? How come if Islam is bad, if Islam is terrorism, bad guy oppresses a woman, how come these guys are good? You know, it was a, a, a big question in my mind. So this is, this is not possible. So even though when I was like encouraging them to, to go do bad, they were like, no, sometimes they, hold on, let me just go pray. I say, how come? What is this, you know? What is this? Why the media? I'm with my classmates and they're not like that. So it just caught my attention and I started to research you know, and the first time that I hit Quran, it was just my skin just was like, like there was something, something in, in my, in, inside of me and I say, what is this? And, and you know, I, I, I know how to play guitar because I learned it in, in the chorus, in the chorus, in, in the church, in the Catholic church. So I say, these guys, the Muslims, they sing very well. I thought it was a song. I didn't know that it was recitation of Quran. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not going to give you guys any story. I, I'm just going to say I was a tough guy. And I didn't choose Islam. Wallahi, I didn't choose Islam. Uh, I hear just Islam like on the media, you know, the, the, the bad side of it. I never dig it out because I was not interested. I was living the dunya, the life, my way. So I was not taking guidance from nobody. Nobody couldn't tell me what to do or not what to do because I was a tough guy. So. I made a lot, a, lot, a lot of mistakes, and one night in my in my sleep, um, I woke up in my sleep and I was I was dressed up like this, the way I am now. Tall, calling the Asan, and I remember I was up in the tower calling the Asan. When I looked down, I saw a lot of brothers wearing the kufin and the taupe, making suyut and the sun rising. And when I finished in the, the asan, the adhan, I went to a different chamber. And I was speaking Arabic with three sisters covered in black. I couldn't see their faces, anything. I have three women on my side, speaking to me. But I couldn't see their faces because of the uh, hijab and the thick, um, yes. So that was the first sign, but I was living the dunya, so I was not interested. I, I said, uh, it was just a dream, you know? So the second, second dream I had uh, about something like that, I was just in the middle of a lot of people, and the devil was trying to take me, the shaitan. Remember on my dream, I said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and he let me go. And that made me think more of what's going on. Why do I have, why I, I am dreaming this? So I Google it up, the address for the nearest masjid, 
live three minutes away from the masjid. I didn't know it was a masjid. Like a house. The uh, Mesquite Islamic Center on Franklin near I-80. And it was not on the, it, I was not ready for it. I was not accepting it because I didn't know what Islam was going to bring to me, but I said, it's not for me. I don't have time. So one day, one day, all, all of a sudden, the, I, I said, no many times, something inside my chest tell me to go there. Something, something guide me there to the masjid. So I have this tough feeling in my chest, like oppression. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't resist no more. I park on the, on the, on the masjid, and if you go to the masjid of Mesquite, it looks like a house. On the back, there is a, the, the room for worship. I don't know. I park like I already know. I walk around the house thinking maybe if it's a house, I'm going to get shoot or something because you're in private property. So I walk around. First thing I hear, it was the Adhan. So when I hear the Adhan, the door, I remove my shoes. I got in and I follow the, the, the prayer. When the prayer was over, the Sheikh, uh, <clears throat> his name is uh, Sheikh Moa. He said, Salaam Alaikum, and I don't know what to say. He said, You speak English? Arab? I said, No, Mexiki. He said, Please come. He said, Why do you make suyud if you're not Arab? You're not Muslim. And I tell him my reasons. And he started crying. And that day, I took shahada. <sighs> the, sweetest, the sweetest thing I hear when I took my shahada was, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Takbir. That, got, that went into my heart deep. And uh, probably a week and a half, two weeks later, I have, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me the confirmation that I was on the right path. Again, uh, I didn't know about this. I never see this. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm dreaming that on the sky, a big door opens with writing in Arabic. A big door. And I'm walking and everybody, hey, do you know what that says? Nobody couldn't tell me what it says until I got to this guy. And he said, yes, that's very simple. He said, that says that on the day, on the month of Ramadan, doors of heaven are open. And that was a confirmation that it was not just a dream. It was not just a dream. And I was on the right path. So since that day I took Shahada, I took this very seriously. I dropped everything down. Even the little beliefs that I had, traditions, everything. everything. Because when they told me, now that you became Muslim, it's a new, it's a second chance for you. Don't waste it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to erase all your bad deeds and turn your bad deeds into good deeds. And since then, there is no one day that I go, that it goes by without remembering the name of Allah. And I don't know, some people said I'm obsessed and radical. I'm not radical and not obsessed with Islam. I fall in love with Islam. That's the, that's, that's the difference. I love Islam so much that through my day, I have to be listening to, to surahs, to 
to um, stories of the Sahaba. My, my imam is very strong, but that gives me more imam when I hear to the stories of the Sahaba, how it used to be on those dates. And I can go on and on, but... Takbir! 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 All right, so like I mentioned before, I was a pretty agnostic guy. I hated, I mean, hated religion. I thought organized religion was a bunch of BS. I'm not going to lie. Um, I had a bunch of friends. I made a lot of uh, Korean friends, and they were pretty religious themselves. Um, whenever they would mention God, I'd just kind of like give them the cheek. It's like, yeah, whatever. All right, believe what you want. Um, and even when I, whenever someone would tell me, it's like, wow, you're so blessed. You have such a nice house. It's like, what do you mean? My dad worked for this. It was my dad. I, was, I just had a, a thing against God. I don't know why, uh, but there was a fire in my heart. I, and I know it because I felt it whenever anybody mentioned God, anybody ever mentioned religion. So, you know, it was at that time that I, I became more philosophical. I read a bunch of books, a bunch of books on religion, philosophy in general. Um, you know, Aristotle, Plato, just about justice, life, what is life. Um, I even read books on Satanism, <laughs> uh, and honestly, it was just some crazy stuff, but it was just something that was educationally fulfilling for me. I felt, if anything, closer to the purpose of life just by learning. Um, ironically, I came to Islam just because I had a bunch of Muslim friends, and you know, obviously I heard a bunch of crazy stuff on the, on, on the news, it's like, oh, these terrorists, you know killing this, killing that. It's like, well, my friends are Muslims, and so far they haven't killed anyone. So maybe, you know, not, not all Muslims are crazy, and Islam doesn't promote death. You know, so I remember it was uh, my senior year of high school. That's when I kind of had uh, a phase of, wow, high school went by so fast, and now I'm graduating. What's going to come after graduation? Okay, college after college. Okay, hopefully get a nice job. After getting a nice job, you know, maybe raise a family, have kids, grow old, die, then what? I had, I had no clue. Yeah. I, I, obviously, I read a bunch of books on, on different beliefs, the, re, the idea of reincarnation. Uh, my grandpa, he's uh, totally different from my grandma. My grandma's totally religious. My grandpa is a really open minded person, he loves philosophy. He believes in reincarnation. He does not believe Jesus was the Son of God or God himself. Uh, he has his own different ideas. And we always used to talk a lot. And so, you know, the idea of reincarnation never really fulfilled me. If anything, it kind of scared me. I don't want to be a tree or something. So, you know, um, so ironically, when I, first, uh, when, when I first heard about Islam, you know, it was through my friends and all that kind of stuff. I had Muslim friends. I go online, I'm like, okay, let's see, let's see what, the, what Google says. Well, let's see what Professor Google says. So I type in Quran, right, and I click you know, the online Quran. The first, if any, verse, not even the first verse, first part of the verse, Allah does not love the unbelievers. I'm like, wow, this is, wow, great, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so he hates me, okay, so not a thing for me. But you know, I had a friend, and uh, he was still such a nice guy that if anything, he actually invited me to uh, some Jumas. And uh, I, you know, just because I wanted to be open-minded, I mean, I still hated the idea of religion to, to a certain extent. Um, I said, yeah, sure, not gonna lie, I was pretty scared. I didn't know what was, what was gonna happen if I was just gonna be, you know, slaughtered right, out, <laughs> right in the middle of the entire place. I don't know, I was just scared. Uh, really no good reason. So I came and, you know, I observed this, like, and uh, the first khutbah that I heard was actually uh, by Brother Noman Ali Khan. And I, ju I just couldn't help but laugh. This guy, like, this guy was awesome. So, you know, I'm like, okay, it was actually pretty good. It's not that, it's not that deadly after all. So I, you know, left and then he invited me to another one. I went, okay, nice. Still another good one. I, I don't remember who, get who was the time, but it was still pretty good. Uh, Third one, fourth one, whatever. Okay, so fifth one, I decided, you know what? I'm going to try and pray with you guys because uh, you guys seem to be getting somewhere. So I pray, you know, I've kind of awkwardly because I felt like I don't know where, like, my body should be when I'm in Suchu. Like, I felt like I was about to fall over. I don't know. 
But nonetheless, I felt like I was getting somewhere because when I was a kid, I tried praying in many different ways, trying to get closer to God. I remember like kneeling next to my bed, you know, and doing all that kind of stuff, but never really felt anything. But when I put my head on the floor and, and during sujood, wow, I was like, I'm getting somewhere in life now. You know, I feel it. I didn't accept Islam at that time, though. You know, it took about maybe two more Jumas, and then I decided, you know what, 2.30 a.m. in the morning, I was reading uh, the Quran, the English version, obviously. And you know what, I'm like, well, it, everything, I believe that there is a God. I did not know much about Muhammad. I just kind of left that to the side. I just like the idea of, you know, Tawheed, got it. Okay, I love that. Um, so, you know what, 2.30 in the morning, I just... I, I spilled a glass of water on myself, and I don't even know how the heck that even felt. Like, I was holding it. All of a sudden, I drop it on my pants. I'm like, wow, what just happened? And, you know, like, again, philosophical guy that I am, I'm like, does that mean something? I don't know. But you know what? I don't Islam is kind of to go. And once I accepted, I mean, I can't, I can't say, but if, if anything, it was alleviating. I felt like I, I actually had you know, an idea of what the world was. It wasn't just like this, and that's it. Um, but if I didn't accept Islam, I'm going to tell you what my sister says. I would have become an alcoholic. That's what she says. I, I mean, I was a casual drinker. I wouldn't say I was a big... But, I mean, it was, it was definitely a wild ride, and every, I've, I've loved Islam all the way. It doesn't matter what people say. We're killers, whatever, man. Like, do your research, and trust me, you'll find the truth, inshallah. After a year of 19, I got into a trouble in my country. I ran into a loud. I had a bad situation. Some child were fired. I handled that nobody got hurt. So do it there find my brother who was here. He decided to bring me here to the United States. He said, you'll be safe if you're here. So I came here. I never been a religious guy, but coming from a Hispanic country, we all, our background is a Catholic. That's the only religion they teach you at school over there. But one thing always has been clear with me, in, in Catholicism, you have to, what they call it, you have to confess. When you commit a sin, you have to go before the, uh, the preacher and you tell him your sins, and he's going to say, oh, do this, this, pray, and your sin going to be forgiven. I never did that because uh, I feel like the only one who can forgive is uh, God, no man. Because he is a man just like me, so I never really went to confess anything. Being here, Three months after I got here, my brother left because being he, he was like a lot of people, he was breaking the law. And so he had to let, he let me by myself out like here. And I went following full step, breaking the law, my freedom. Being incarcerated is another level. The, the best definition is here in this situation. And I always hear about Islam, but uh, I never get in contact with any Muslim before. Happened to us out among all these people, they were two guys that they were different than anybody else, the way that they carried themselves. So one time I saw them doing salah. I don't even know what it was back then. So after they finished, I approached them what they were doing. They like, oh, we were praying. I say, what religion it is? They like, oh, we Muslim. Oh. So I just asked them if they can give me some type of information. Pray that I can give some information on my hands. They did give me information, address. In Houston, I sent a request. They sent me a book called Fundamental, Fundamentals of Islamic Doctrine. After I read the book, really, I found everything that I believe that's what the book was saying. So it was really nothing new to me. After that, they, I get a Quran. They sent me a Quran, and the thing that struck me when I was reading the Surah Al Baqarah 2, 219, when they talk about. They ask, oh, Muhammad, they ask you concerning uh, gambling and uh, alcohol drinking and gambling. And they say it's uh, say to them as a, as a great sin and some benefit, but the, the uh, sins, the harm. the harm is greater than the benefit. So when I read that, it just played on my mind what happened to me. I saw my mama get killed by a drone driver. saw my bro, uh, my bro did the same thing, killed his best friend when he was in a state of intoxication. And my friend did the same thing. So for me, right there was the confirmation. I already was Muslim back then, but I mean, that was the confirmation right there for me. Assalamu alaikum. Everybody's up. Alhamdulillah, some of the brothers have been able to 
uh, one of the most intimate uh, experiences that they have not for entertainment. This has a purpose. We hope that the young Muslims can hear this and not go that, not to choose that route. You don't have to go that route. This is Jahaliyah for us. It's sad to see some of the young Muslims trying to run exactly to that lifestyle. And for the old ones, they will know that these things can take place if we don't take care of business. Uh, me, uh, as you know, I was inspired by one of the greatest uh, drug dealers that we have in, in the United States, uh, through Hollywood, Scarface. You know that little guy from Cuba? Okay. So I came to the States and I tried to do the same thing. I was uh, used, to, used to be a pilot, and I used to travel with stuff from Texas to the other states. And so I ended up going to prison also for nine and a half years to study uh, psychology. In that process, in that penitentiary, I also was able to observe people. Like you brothers have been observed by the people that you deal with in a day. I was observing these guys through a window. And I found them really in particular because these guys were three guys. It was three of them, and they always used to hang with each other. Me, being from the street, I knew that something was up. I don't mind. Three guys always together. So I was peeping to see if I was able to see any kind of funny motions, maybe rubbing or touching. And then I realized that, well, I was saying to myself, these guys cannot be, you know, that kind of guys, because there's three of them. And normally they either hang by twos or fours. Because the other one is afraid that maybe the other one will play. That's one of the reasons. I'm in the process of looking to this guy's real close. I'm like, where? And he called this guy and said, what are you looking at? And I say, these three guys, I'm trying to see if they're going to make a move now. And I said, no, man, what? No, man, they Muslims. I say, Muslims? He said, yes, 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 they Muslims. That's the reason they're always with each other. They eat with each other and all this stuff. I said, OK. So he asked me, what do you know about them? I say, well, um, I know man, yeah, when one of the guys invite me in the other, in the other, in the other uh, facility, and you know, when I heard about this, people talking about God like for one hour, and I was pretty excited, and I went to some of my compadres and shared the news like we always do. And some of them, one of them in particular, say, you know, yeah, I went to one of the services, and these guys, you know, they say something about God, but they also believe in five guys. I say, here we go, man. I have problems with three. You're talking about they believe in five? <laughs> and then this guy says, yeah, you can ask any of them. I mentioned this because sometimes we made a mistake. I mentioned to Islam to people about all these principles. What this guy heard from some Muslims was that it is five pillars in Islam. He disregarded the whole thing about God, and he remembers that it's five pillars. Pillars to us, coming from nonsense, Catholicism, and all this nonsense, is things that you worship. Pillars to us, as things that you probably go and worship. Put bananas, light a candle, you name it. So I say five, I man, forget it. I leave them guys alone until I meet this other guy. And he was able to clarify it for me. And since then, you know, attend the services in 120 and something years up now, here I am, alhamdulillah. And yes, it's Jahalil. And we have mentioned one of the most intimate things that happened to our lives for you brothers to know. There is no dandy dandy. Some of the Muslims trying to run to this lifestyle, there's nothing happening in there. That's the only reason. And also to have some understanding, there is many of beautiful brothers like this clan that are sitting here, out there that they need to hear about this. Inshallah. Allah. <laughs> Allah. <laughs> 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 Um, you know, by the way, Brother Abdurrahman, I met him when he got out of this uh, university. They call it the university, right? <laughs> he did nine and a half years, so it's equivalent to maybe a master PhD in human psychology. And when he came out, he said, um, you know, I heard about a Colombian guy who's like telling people about Islam, and he said, somebody told me you were working on this. Let me know how I can help. That's how I met this guy. And ever since he said, let me know how I can help, <clears throat> we sat for one year between my father, uh, brother Abdullah here, and him, and we studied the oneness of Allah for one year so that we could prepare how we would package this and explain it to our people in the Spanish language. One year we dedicated to preparing to open up the doors to really engage the people. 
And I must say that whatever life he had in, the, in, in his past, the people who know him, now after he became Muslim, they think he's a totally different human being. He's gone through a lot of uh, difficulties, okay? Shootouts and all kinds of crazy things. But when I realized, when I went to Colombia, my first time when I was Muslim, Alhamdulillah, my father had accepted Islam, uh, my wife had accepted Islam, and, and my mother had Islam. And when I was in Colombia, in South America, where my wife was the only woman wearing hijab in the whole city, no masjid, no imams, no adhan, nothing. His mother and um, aunt and about eight family members of his, when he told them that there was a Muslim, I was traveling in Colombia, they traveled three hours on a bus to come to the city where we were to find out what it is that changed this man. And we came and sat down for one hour. It was my father and one of my girl cousins from Colombia. And when they asked questions about Islam, after one hour of questioning, every one of them accepted Islam. Eight of them, his mother, subhanAllah, his brother, aunt, and my, my girl cousin who was with us, she didn't even know about any of this. And crying and she also accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. So our, our first trip to Colombia, 14 people accepted Islam and we weren't even there for da'wah or anything. That lets you see that a lot of these people are on the brink of trying to find something, right? Because of the hardship they went through. That's what register. At the beginning, some of the people who left and only felt the pain, right? It's like, oh my God, these people messed up. But when you realize that Islam, alhamdulillah, for us, it really um, helped us, mashallah. So with the sister and we're talking about that transition or what Islam actually did for you and if you didn't have Islam, at, I mean, where you were in life and what would have happened if you didn't even have this deen. So, inshallah, we'll conclude. Right after Hearing all of your stories, they're so inspiring, and um, I wish I had a better story, but I'll make it really brief because we are a little time. But um, I fell in love with the dunya, and um, like all love stories, there is heartbreak. Through heartbreak, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the best of providers, and He provides who He wills, and in mysterious ways, uh, He provided me friends that I got to learn the true Islam. And through the media, uh, the correct media, I learned uh, what really Islam is. And although the story be ends with um, heartbreak, it also ends with the love of something much greater than that. And that is the love of Subhanatala. And I know my heart will never be broken again. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, when I was a teen, and through a teen to probably 19, 18 years old, I was very materialistic. I had to have the biggest nails. I had to have the biggest hair. I had to have the best purse. I got in debt just for $900 shoes. Yeah, that's the noise everybody should be making because nobody should be paying 900 bucks for shoes. Um, it was just my life. I didn't have anything better going on for me. Um, I'm a professional makeup artist. I used to do models. Um, I used to do half-naked models. I used to do nude models all the time. And they were just hangers. They, don't, they, they didn't become women. They were not women. They were not their mothers, their sisters, to these people that were working with them. Eventually, I just saw them as a hanger myself. The industry of the beauty industry is very tough. It's a very, very tough industry. They make you want to see something that is not there and make you believe that's what you should look like for all the ladies up there. Long story. I was doing great. I was making lots of money. It was amazing. I bought myself a BMW convertible. I was single at the time. I thought I looked cool. So I, I thought it was great. I used to party. I used to go to the club. Um, for us Hispanics, because when I came here to Dallas, we used to go to the club all the time. And there were always Arabs, always Arab men, Middle Eastern men at the club. And Middle Eastern men at the club. So, so, uh, huh? Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern men were at the club, a lot of them. So a lot of the Latin ladies, Middle Eastern men, so they used to go there for that purpose. Now, for some reason, one day we were all there at the club having fun, and we're like, where are the Middle Eastern men? It was Ramadan, the first day of Ramadan. <laughs> so 
they were not there. So for a whole month, we all wondered what happened to this man. We were just really thinking what, what happened. Um, long story short, Eid came. I figured out now that it's Eid, and they were there once again. So the moment that Eid happened, they were all there back at the club, and everything was like normal, 360 uh, four days after, then again it happens, so so on and so forth. Um, it, it, it was just fun. So I remember one time one of my friends was really drunk, and he just said, yeah, yeah, Allah Akbar with a drink. It's the Allah. And I was like, what did you just say? And he said, Allah Akbar. I'm like, okay, well, what is that? So I started asking questions, and a lot of these people were drunk, and a lot of these people were giving dawah while drunk. Now, <laughs> it's true, but the, the honest truth, what happens, I mean, Right? But what happens and what I'm trying to give with the story is that a lot of us judge people because if you have somebody in your family that is in the wrong path, that's doing something that he's not supposed or she's not supposed to be doing, I found out about Islam through these people. So if you guys think that drunk people or people that are you know, Muslim that are not in the right path will not eventually you know, say that to other people, it's, it's untrue. Thanks to these people, I started figuring out what Islam was. If I was given the choice back then to become a Muslim, I would have not become a Muslim because I didn't choose Islam. I became Muslim because I had a dream. Two angels approached me and they came on my dream. I couldn't see their face. I mean, I could see their faces, but they couldn't speak. Uh, when the angels came up to me, they asked me, why would you like to become a Muslim? And I said, because Allah will take care of me. I had no clue what Allah was. Maybe one of those drunk things that my friends were saying were sticking to me. Um, but I said, because Allah will take care of me. So the angels asked me then if I could go to a second person, another man. It was a prophet, and he was sitting on top of a big rock. And he, he, he made this hand gesture like, come. I went near to him, and his eyes were so blue like sapphire. It, it was unbelievable. And he asked me, why would you like to become a Muslim? And I said, because Allah will take care of me. So the angels take me to a third destination, and my third destination was to go meet with God. I'm finally go, going to go meet Allah, the, the God I've been praising that I wanted to convert for. When I'm on my way to meet with God, the angels look back at me, I look at them, we look at each other, and it just, they kind of made me doubt myself, and I was, so I started doubting myself. So I closed my eyes and I said, God, if you exist, if, if, you, if this is real, if, if I must belong somewhere, could you please give me a sign that this is the right thing to do? Before I finished that sentence, before I said the right thing to do in my head, a big lightning bolt stroke right in front of me and the angels. And they looked back at me and they said, you doubted yourself. And that's what we were looking for. And I woke up. I never converted after a year. It took me a year. In that year, I was doing amazing. I was having friends. But then all of a sudden, I lost my job. When you lose your job and you have no money, you lose friends. You lose friends and you lose money. You don't have the cute things as a girl that you want to have. So. I, I lost boyfriend, my, I was partying all the time, going to nowhere. So long story short, I really had nothing going for me. I probably would have, I don't know what I would have become. I mean, it, I, I just had no direction. I didn't have a dad at that point. I had my stepdad. My mom got married to an American, so we came here to the US. So I remember one time I was sitting in my, um, in my apartment. I didn't have money for rent. My mom kicked me out. I was another girl from Monterrey as well, and she gave me uh, a place to stay. I remember I didn't know how I was going to pay anything. I was about to lose my car. I used to ask friends of mine uh, to help me with money for the rent, and then all of a sudden that asking for money became a regular thing to do. Hey, would you help me? Hey, would you help me? And it just becomes so easy, so you just start asking people. So what ended up happening was that I felt so alone. People realized that they were not going to end up giving me money because they didn't have to. I had to go I got laid off 10 for 10 jobs in one year because I couldn't keep a stable job. I had nothing. I really had absolutely nothing going for me. I wanted to kill myself. I didn't do it because I knew that there was a God somewhere. But I just really didn't like what was going on. So I remember very clear I was sitting down in my apartment. I was looking at the, at the window and I was so upset that nobody, none of my friends that I used to help, that I used to go out and party, not even the Muslim guys that were partying too, nobody called me and asked me how I was doing. I could have been dead and nobody would have found me in my apartment. So what happened to me was that in that specific moment it hit me and I thought none of my friends called me. I'm so alone, I'm such a lonely person. Well, they're so bad, they're, they're such horrible friends. And then there, 
I said, no, I am the horrible friend. God created me. I've been looking for God all my life since I was a kid, and I never called him. I never asked him anything. I never prayed. How, if, if I feel so bad about my friends not calling me, I can only imagine how God feels that I do not even call upon him. So I broke down. And all of a sudden, I just remembered one of these drunk guys gave me a Quran <laughs> one time, and it was right there, and I grabbed it, and I looked at it, and I would never forget that I said, Allah, Allah will take care of me, like my dream, like a year ago. So what happened was that, of course, I had no hijab. I had the thickest scarf available. I grew up, put the thickest scarf I had. I tried to uh, you know, find a mosque somewhere. This was the mosque where I converted. Um, four years ago, or five years ago, and I came here, and I remember I said, I'm going to come here, and I said, I don't want to convert today, that they, for some reason, I just said, I want to I wanna convert, but I don't want to convert today. I want it to be next Friday, because I want it to be special. I want to call all my drunk Muslim friends, and I want them to come to the mosque, and I want them to cheer for me and fist bump, um, and that's what happened, and I came the next Friday, uh, Sister Delhi helped me, um, Sister Sandra, that's up there, helped me as well, and it was amazing, and all my drunk friends were here, and they were sober for the first time that I saw them. And subhanAllah, after that, it's just been great, and it's been amazing. So never ever doubt that if you're in the wrong path, you can always go back, and not because of my story, but because of those Muslims that, you know, taught me something. Just a quick note, real quick. A lot of people, sometimes when they see me, they ask me if I'm Arab, because I look Arab. And I said, no, I'm from Mexico, and I have to give the whole spiel. Um, and then they ask me, oh, because your husband's Muslim. And I said, so you're Muslim because your husband's Muslim? And I said, no. I mean, actually, it's funny because my, my, my husband was a born Muslim, um, but he was not practicing. When I, when I met him, he, I actually saw him one of those times at the club, but I didn't know it was him later on. Long story short, a lot of people ask me if I converted for my husband. I didn't. I always say my husband converted for me because my husband completely stopped everything because it became a competition. You know, like who was better Islamically, and you know, it just became instead of being part-time Muslims, we became full-time Muslims, and it's been great. And everything in my life changed completely. I'm, I'm happy with who I am for the first time. I'm happy with my family. I'm happy with my God, and I think it reflects. It really does. And definitely see, at first, how I was crying, and it was thinking of my past. It was so emotional. But just talking about Islam and talking about Allah, it's it just got me happier. So. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate everybody. And thanks to the brothers for your story. So uh, high school, I went to university. And I used to like drinking a lot. Um, we used to go every Friday. You know, everybody put together a little bit of money. We'd go and buy some liquor, serve it, share it with everybody. One of those Fridays, I see some guy with a turban all the way at the end of the faculty because I was going to law school. And this guy had a red turban. And it seemed so weird to me. And the guys I was going to go and drink with, uh, they knew him. So I said, let's talk to this guy. He seems so interesting. What is that stuff he has on his head? And I went to talk to him and you know, ask him about what it is that you're wearing. What is it? And he says, it's a turban. Why are you wearing that stuff? I say, I'm a Muslim, and you know, it's, it's traditional for us. Oh, what is that? And um, I had known about Christianity, uh, several sects of Christianity. I grew up in a Catholic church, uh, Catholic environment. Catholic nuns used to teach us and all this stuff. So I knew a little bit about uh, religion and the prophets. Um, but this guy started talking about God and, and started to talk about Muhammad and, um, and I didn't really feel very interested, right? Um, I didn't know very much, didn't care very much about religion. I just wanted to go out and drink because I was missing out at the moment. Um, but this guy, he was, I was very surprised. He was very nice. Even I was being very rude asking these questions, and he was so nice and so when he was talking to me. And um, so I decided not to go drinking and stay and listen because he was going to give a lecture about Islam at the university, at the faculty of um, law school. I went and I listened to it, and I was, it, it was so interesting, so interesting. I had no idea why. I don't even remember what the topic was about. So uh, later on, I, I continued to see him because we, we, we both were going to study there. And I started to, to, to get close to him, to talk to him, because it was so interesting. I had no idea why. SubhanAllah. Um, and I asked, started 
asking questions about Islam. He never pushed Islam towards me. He said Islam is this, Islam is that, we believe in this. He, he told me one time and he just left it alone. He was just really nice to me. And it became very interesting that. And then I started asking about where do you guys worship? What do you guys worship? What do you guys do? I think I did it for about a month and a half and he said uh, Abu Bakr, uh, his name was Bolivar. I said, to the mosque, I want to see what it is that you guys do. It's, it's so interesting. I've never seen such a thing. And I went to the mosque one Friday, Jummah, uh, Salat al Jummah. And um, the, the Sheikh, I met him and, and he, it, it was very amazing. He said it how the prophets clean themselves before going to pray. How they take the shoes off because you're in sacred land. This is a space that you used to worship. And, and he was all like, I said this before, I read about this in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Um, so I, I was very surprised and, 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 and I was very intrigued by this. And then I started talking to the Sheikh, it was the Imam Sukiyo, Yahya Sukiyo. Um, and, and, and he started talking to me about how you clean yourself before you enter. And then you clean yourself properly, you present yourself clean to God, and then you worship Him. And then you prostrate yourself. Like uh, you've been told, and, and so he, you know, he knew that I was Catholic, uh, grew up as a Catholic. So he mentioned Abraham, he mentioned Noah, he mentioned Jesus, and you know, in the Bible says that they used to go and do that. And um, Subhanallah, I continue to go every Friday after that. I didn't miss one Juma, Alhamdulillah. Um, then they implemented the Saturday classes, so I started going Friday and Saturday. Um, the, the, the wife of the Sheikh, she would teach the kids, and I would go and listen too. So it was a bunch of kids and me. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, SubhanAllah, I, to me Islam became very logical. I, I didn't accept because of much inspiration or anything like that. Islam made sense in my head. Uh, you had to be good to people, good to your neighbor, good to your parents, uh, keep the relationships of blood, um, be good to everyone, tell the truth. And, and I always believe telling the truth. Uh, this line is, something, line is something that I dislike very much. So after six months of going to the mosque, I decided, you know, this is what God created us for, to worship Him in this manner. So I decided to take Shahada, Alhamdulillah. I was 17 years old. Uh, SubhanAllah, I'm the only Muslim in my family. Uh, I became 18, years. so I stayed in Ecuador until I was 18. I, uh, I did my first Ramadan over there. It became so easy. I, I could not understand if you go any regular day, Hungry, uh, you don't need your for breakfast, you're gonna be so hungry for lunch. And Ramadan became so easy, you have something very little in the morning, and then the entire day you can go without any problem. These things they, they were incredible to me. Um, so, Alhamdulillah, um, I think that uh, if I had not become a Muslim, I probably would be a drunk because I really did enjoy going out to drink and having party and par par uh, going to meet with friends and uh, uh, dancing and all this stuff. So, um, Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. Trajectory would have been either jail or uh, six feet deep. Six feet deep, meaning dead. That's where I think I would have been without Islam. Uh, Islam, specifically reading about the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 14 years old. I knew that at that moment when I finished reading that book that Islam, but I wasn't ready to accept Islam. Uh, because, you know, you're still young and you want to hang out. And I thought you had to be like Malcolm X to accept Islam. Very disciplined. I wasn't ready for that. By the time I was 19 years old, I started to see bad characteristics, bad characteristics that I had were affecting my little sister who was 12. And I said to myself, I need to change. And I remember being at a house party the very last time I ever drank. And an American terrorist detonated a bomb in the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. And I remember looking at everyone having a good time partying, and on their TV, it was people bleeding, you know, it was breaking news at the time. And I thought to myself, this just was very strange. Seeing people trying to survive, such a tragedy just happening, people dying. Here we are just, you know, having, quote unquote, a good time, not thinking about anything but ourselves and our desires. And I said to myself, I need to change my life. And I remember, alhamdulillah, and inshallah we'll talk about this more tomorrow, one of, uh, a, a brother who had just Islam, he came to uh, the video store that I was working in, and my birth name is Christian, 
so he says to me, you know, you're, you're, you know, how you doing, Christian? You know, that's a good Christian name. And for whatever reason, I thought this guy was Christian because only people, only Christians preach to you about anything about God. And I already knew Islam was the truth. I started reading about it. So when he asked me, what religion are you? And I said, my parents are Catholic. But I said, what about you? And I said, I want to be a Muslim. I don't know why I said it, but I said it. And he was like, with his nephew, saying something in Arabic. Later on, I find out was SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And what was amazing about this brother, Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him and reward him. He came to see how I was doing, which was strange for people from the streets when someone comes to see what you're doing or wants to know what, you know, just comes to visit you. They want something. But he just was really trying to find out, you know, just my well-being. And after a month of talking to him, finally he took us to a big mosque, me and another friend of mine. And uh, there was about over 200 people from the Jamaat Tablik from Indonesia and Bangladesh. And they told us to sit in the back. And amazingly, alhamdulillah, we made up. But at the time he was telling the brother who brought me to the masjid, they shouldn't accept Islam. Because look at them, I had an earring on, I had my pants sagging, we looked like a bunch of gangsters. He shouldn't accept Islam. And I remember he's having, I was angry at that brother for a long time, he's trying to stop me from becoming Muslim. But alhamdulillah, he come, the, the Iqbal, may Allah bless him, he came, sat down, asked me some questions. You know, we accepted Islam, asked me what name myself, and I said, well, my mother made me Christian, you know, to follow the way of Christ. So when I knew that, you know, I found out that, you know, in Arabic, Jesus was Isa, I said, I'm going to change my name to Isa. And never forget that day of, out of the, all the 200 hugs that I got and people crying and my first utter and all that. It's just remembering the feeling of just freedom, of just a lot of pressure that I had spiritually, gone. And alhamdulillah, later on, one of the reasons why I changed was my little sister, Allah bless her and guided her to Islam. <laughs> 30 seconds, mashallah. <laughs> 29, inshallah. Right? Bismillah, sallallahu alayhi wa My first contact with Islam as a, as a teenager was in 1993 when uh, Michael Jordan retired and I was for a new favorite player. Right? So now I, I picked this guy who in 1991 accepted Islam, Chris Jackson. 1993, he changed his name to Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. I was stuck because I, we didn't have many channels to watch the NBA back in the days. You only had the, the access to see your local team. So I only had two options, New Jersey Nets or New York Knicks. I said, I, I don't like the Nets. I was born in New York. Go with the Knicks. That year, the New York Knicks, I, I picked also as, as my favorite player because I used to like uh, shooting the ball. John Starks. So that year, the Knicks played Houston Rockets finals. My brother's going for the Houston Rockets. I'm going for the Knicks. Hakeem displayed patience and tolerance in the midst of all the trash talking from the I knew my team. And then he used to fast in the games as well. So it, that, you know, impacted me as well. Hakeem Black Starks. Houston Rockets won the game, and at that time, I used to hate Hakeem Olajuwon with a passion, right? I also came in contact with Islam through Malcolm X, through the autobiography of Malcolm X, which gave me hope that change is possible. Then, during that time, I was involved in a gang, and one of my gang brothers, I was actually ranked number four, one of uh, my gang brothers wanted and I stole it for him. Right, so the first Quran that I ever touched was the, and some people say, well, you stole the pocket-sized Quran, right? Or the, or the little one that they hang on the chain. I was like, nah, I stole the Abdullah Yusuf Ali, Arabic, English, and commentary, right? I said to myself, if I could steal, if I could steal Tim's, I could steal Quran, yeah. <laughs> and the Tim's are big, right? The, the, the construction. Timberlands, right? Construction boots. You guys know Timberland, right? <laughs> so I used to steal Timberlands. I, how can I not steal this Quran? So, and he was like, but it wasn't for you. I said, I was a loyal friend. This is my boy. So I have to, you know, show my truthfulness, right? 
Later on in 1998, the same gang killed two of my friends, same gang members. They stomped on their faces. I was with them on a Sunday, them on the news. So it really shattered that relationship, right? So at that time, I lost trust in every single human being, with exception of my parents. But the only problem was that my parents did not have the ability to take me out of the... So now, I, be, I turned to God, and when I turned to God, I began to go to different uh, churches. I got six Bibles, and then I went, and I remembered in my house that I had the Quran, because my friend left the Quran at home. Now, I began to look into the Quran and the Bibles. When I look at the Quran, I said, there's a book for Arabs. I'm not going to, I'm just going to take... Whatever benefits me, and that's it. You know, I'm not gonna. You know, it says in the name of Allah. I'm gonna say in the name of God. I'm not. I'm not accustomed to saying Allah, so I would change it in the name of God. In the name of God. So anyway, so as I was reading, I spent nine months reading the Quran. My mom, when she saw me, she was like, uh, she left me alone. Later on, she told me he's not in the street. He's reading scriptures, and he. I'm like, I'm gonna leave him alone. You know. It's better because every day she says she used to fear for my life. Because every day, sometimes I would just wake up, go out in the street, and I'll be in the cop car. So my mom, when she sees me in the house, she said, I'm going to leave him alone. So now, as I was reading the Quran, I began to practice it without kefiyah, without knowing how to, okay? So now I come across a, a verse from the Quran. Anytime I came across, try this, it's, it's fun. Whenever you come across a verse from the, I know you guys have, you guys have many shoes, so yeah, you guys didn't have that struggle that we had. But when I used to come across a command in the Quran, I would try to implement it. So I came across the ayah, Kutiba alaykum usiyam. So I began to fast, but I wasn't as lucky as you guys. I didn't know Maghrib existed. <laughs> right? You guys know, you know what happens like between Asr and Maghrib. Uh, we got to get this, we got to get this, I'm, I'm craving for this, right? I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not a hypocrite. I know that I got food in my refrigerator. I want to feel the pain that the poor people feel, right? When I feel that pain, then I'll break my fast. So I would fast, right? I would fast. But honestly, what did that do? I came to a realization that if I could leave food, and sometimes I used to go with girls, and they used to try to give me a kiss. And I'm like, I I'm not interested. I'm fasting. She was like, you think I'm ugly? She's like, come on. I'm not saying anything. I'm fasting. But at times, I used to have to run away a little bit. But that situation helped me develop that strength. Then I read an ayah in the Quran, in the Quran al Fajr kana mashhuda. Quran in Fajr is witness. So I'll wake up in the middle of the night when all of my family members are sleeping. Me, my two, my two brothers, my parents. And I began to read the Quran at night. I would turn on a, a dim light to try to prevent them from waking up. And I used to try to do it just in secret between me and God. Right? And it became a daily thing. And every time I did that, when it was breakfast time and my parents are getting ready to work, I already felt accomplished. I said, they're just waking up. I already did something. Whenever I, I would read like an hour of Quran, I would make sujood, and I would go to sleep. I continued doing that until I read the whole Quran, the whole Abdullah Yusuf Ali with the commentary and everything. And then I said to myself, you know, I got to learn how to pray. I got to go to the mosque. God is going to ask me, why you didn't go to the mosque? And I began to really think about the Day of Judgment, think about accountability. So I decided to go to the mosque. The mosque happened to be in the same block that I used to hang out with my friends. And I chose the best day. Which is the best day? There you go. In Jahiliya too? Yes. Friday, right? And back in the days, Friday was the best day too. So I go there and I find my friends outside by the mosque. On the air, you know, drinking and hanging out. At that time, I didn't want to drink. I just want to go to the mosque standing in front of the, the mosque, the North Hudson Islamic Educational Center, and I'm looking at top, on top of the, it was the biggest Masonic temple before it was converted into a mosque. And it has a, 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 the word Allah in the center. 
So I was looking at it, and I wanted to go in. A, a friend of mine that used to play ball with me passed by, and he, his name happened to be Muhammad, and he knows me from school. And I said, Muhammad, I want to talk to you. He said, what? Come here, come here. I said, I want to go to the mosque. He's like, you? I was like, yeah. He's like, why? He's <laughs> like, uh... You know, he, he got a custom of people coming to my basement to have a gang meeting because he used to live in the same street. So he knew my reputation. And I said, I read the whole Quran. I believe in everything that's inside of it. And I think that God, if I don't go to the mosque, God, God's going to hold me accountable. And I don't know if I'm going to die. Right? So we made a schedule to go to the mosque. And alhamdulillah, we went to the mosque. It was Maghrib time. He tells me, sit down and, and wait, we're going to pray. I said, I didn't come to watch. I came to pray. You think that's fair? You pray, and I sit and watch? I said, and then pray. This is the first time in my life, after nine months of the Quran being my, my only friend, I used to walk with the Quran everywhere without being embarrassed of the Quran. I used to go to what they call in the south, washateria, right? Laundry mats, right? In, in the north, we call it laundry mats. I used to go to the laundry mat to do my laundry and wait reading Quran. So, subhanAllah, I went to the mosque after salah. I met the Imam. And the first question that came to mind So, how do you come in contact with Islam? And I was like, I the Quran. <laughs> This is his reaction. What? <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I stole the Quran. I read it, and I believe in everything that's inside of it. He was like, honestly, I never seen any imams playing soccer. I never seen any imam run that fast. He went inside the library. He started, he asked me first, you know, what kind of Quran? I said, the Abdullah Yusuf Ali. And he got the Quran, he brought it for me. And he knew, uh, he had some wisdom. He knew that I might just keep the Qur'an that I had a relationship with and, and give away, you know, the, the one that uh, he gave me. So he wrote dedication to me, etc. And he gave me the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, two years later, my mother accepted Islam as well. Four months after her, my dad accepted Islam as well. And Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, you have been very patient. Um, you know, each one of the people here I mean, literally open their heart, right, to share a lot of themselves. Would you agree? Yeah. It's not common that people do this. Would you agree? You know, we walk around in society with a mask, right? Everybody plays a specific role. Whether you're doing something based on your profession, or whether you're playing a role, being a father, you know, a son. Why we do this is because we each have a story that somehow we come to figure out that if people who were given Islam since birth, if they knew the struggle and the difficulty we went through, maybe you would acknowledge that Allah blessed you since birth. And it, it hurts us to see when we struggle and almost lose our lives and accept Islam, to see that people have had Islam all their life and they didn't share it with us. You know, I grew up in a place where there were Muslims. And the day that I found out about Islam was after where a guy who was drinking said, you know, I can't believe I'm still doing this after having gone to Mecca. I said, what is that? Right? He says, where the house of God is. I was like, what? God doesn't have no house on the face of the earth. It doesn't make any sense. And he said, no, it was, it was built by Abraham and Ismail. I said, those are prophets of God. And he said, yeah, Islam is the true religion of God. And it rang true, but I, you know, I was like, everybody says their religion is true. But he said, you know what, I'm not the person to talk about this. Talk to my mother, she was a nun, she, was, she left the convent and so on. She talks to people about this. Many of us, as the sister mentioned, you know, these people who were going out clubbing and so on, similar situation, friends of mine that would go out clubbing, they were Muslim. There's a guy in El Paso whose, whose uncle was in the armed forces and he was in a, he was in a bar and he was drinking with a Muslim. And that Muslim told him about Islam. That individual accepted it. After, do you know that that family in El Paso now 
has three generations worth of Muslims, and they're all like Mexican descent. It's a whole Latino family. Even the grandfather accepted Islam. Okay? We need to look at who or how the individual is who gives the message. What's important is the sacred message. You know, tomorrow we'll be here, inshallah, and we're going to share with you the insight as to how we thought when we weren't Muslim, so that you hopefully can know why your neighbors think of you in the way that they do and why. And it's very important because we're living in a time where misinformation, um, you know, there's phobias, right? There's Islamophobia. It's, an, it's, it's, it, it's not only ignorance, it is a fear of the unknown. And Whenever September 11th happened, you know, I remember I was a new Muslim, and I saw many people running away from the religion of Islam, who were Muslim, right? Men took off their beards, women took off their hijab, and I was sitting there like, you know, I couldn't even explain to my parents why I became Muslim, because they never heard of it. Now everybody heard of this name, and all these people want to know. What were they before September 11th? Were they just to themselves? Who were they talking to? They weren't talking to anybody? They were just building buildings? and schools and trying to keep within them, right? There was a big awakening for this whole community. And I think many of us who became Muslim around the time of September 11th, we have been forced to explain to people who we are. And this is not only for a person who has left Islam, but also people who are given Islam. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلٍ مِنْ مَنْ دَعَيِ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ and who is the best in speech? Then the person that basically, and you see these brothers when they speak, mashallah, maybe this brother, you know, I just met him right now when he walked in. And I was the panel. Did you hear about this dream? He saw Islam in a dream. He saw himself, for some of the brothers who weren't here, saw himself in a dream like this, dressed in that way. He didn't even have a Muslim tell him about Islam. And no shaving. And no shaving. <laughs> He found out about Islam in a dream, subhanAllah. The sister similar. You know, when I wasn't Muslim, I saw something in a dream. It's like I was going around a, a, a place circulating and circulating, and I was getting dizzy. And when I read the Quran and I heard about the Kaaba, and I heard about the Waf, it just, it amazed me. So, who is best in speech? Then the one that calls or invites to Allah, and does righteous deeds. It's not enough just talk, but actually acts upon that. And then when you, you're proud of the fact that you say, I'm a Muslim. We need that from our children. We need that as, a, as human beings. Because there's so many people outside of these walls who have never been informed about Islam. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we open up our hearts to many other people from around our family members and so on, and they know, we have a hard time living life without guidance. You know, I had a friend of mine, 15 years old, sh shoot himself because of the pressure that he was experiencing when we were a youth. And he shot himself in the living room of the woman that I'm married to now. I'm 12. And her and I looked for the truth. And alhamdulillah, after I accepted Islam, she accepted Islam a week later. And we got married a month later. And then soon thereafter, my father accepted Islam. And my mother accepted Islam. And my mother-in-law, who despised my wife, wearing a hijab and said, I'll never go with you anywhere if you dress that way. The day my first daughter was born in the hospital, my daughter's heart stopped beating. And it was a shock for us. And my, my, my mother-in-law was so afraid. And I said, do you witness the fact that we love this creature, right? This human being, and we don't even know it. Right? Who do you think created that? And she said, God. I said, why wouldn't we worship him? She accepted Islam and my daughter was born healthy, alhamdulillah. So there's beautiful things that have happened to us in our lives, right? We wanted to share this with you. But something greater, brothers and sisters, that we have to acknowledge is that Allah blessed us living in this country. You, are, you have the freedom to practice your religion. Regardless of the difficulties we experience, it's nothing in comparison to what the people before us experienced. So tomorrow, inshallah, we will be here, uh, the program says between 12 to 4. We're going to do a program that is a transformational program for community. I know that because we're Latino, 
oh, you know, dealing with Latinos, people think it's all about Latinos. Latinos are just human beings, right? We speak English, we grew up here, right? Many of you may not know my story, but I was a leader of a gang when I was 13 years old as well. So many of us have common, right, trends. So tomorrow we're going to, for the people who come, inshallah, and I encourage you to come, even though it's been coined as a da'wah program, and usually you think, you know, it's just theoretical, we're going to act in a manner that you will understand exactly how the non-Muslims are. So I'll role play. I'll come up to the individual there after we give some background. Uh, Imam Issa Prada, alhamdulillah, is a graduate from Medina University um, in Usuluddin. Uh, and myself, alhamdulillah, and others have been doing this program where it's a four-hour structured course. And if you come, inshallah, you'll be able to better understand how the non-Muslims how you can deal with your neighbors, how you can deal with anyone in society, and have, alhamdulillah, this izzah, you know, this honor of being a Muslim. That's what we're looking for. So, inshallah, between 12 to 4, we'll do that. And then on Sunday, I highly encourage you, brothers and sisters, to invite Spanish speakers to an open house, a Spanish open house entitled Islamic Culture. The last five times within this program, one person has accepted Islam each time. It is a way to uncover or overturn some stuff in the historical context of the Latino community to let them know that El Andalus, Spain, right? We have roots there. Spanish language has over 3,000 words based on the Arabic language. Uh, places like Guadalajara, you know, major city in, 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 in Mexico, comes from Wadal Hijara, which means the Valley of the Rocks. There are so many. Along with, along with Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick, and we've put together a very nice visual presentation. We're, we're asking you to invite non Muslims so they can be educated about the history of their forefathers. When they realize that amongst their lineage they were Muslim, they'll gain the sense of nostalgia that they have with being disconnected from them. Alhamdulillah, if Allah guides a person, as so I said, it's better than anything in this dunya. And even if no one accepts Islam, it doesn't matter. Because that's not our job. Our job is just to educate. So with that, brothers and sisters, we thank you. You've been very patient. Alhamdulillah. We ask for your support, inshallah, and your dua in regards to this work. Um, we were pretty much put in this situation. I don't think any one of us chose it. We felt at some point in time we needed to give up in life. And giving up is actually submitting. And that's why we chose Islam. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One, one second. Just an amana, an amana, because a brother came to me after Jummah today, but we were a little bit caught up. His, his mother happened to be, he's a community member. I don't remember the name, but this is an amana. His mother is actually in a coma. So let's, uh, inshallah, please um, keep, make dua for her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her shifa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her a, a better return uh, to her family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant the family patience during the time of hardship. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her and grant uh, the family with good uh, physicians to help her uh, in this care. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her shifa. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu And thank you so much for ICI. Okay, the Irving community has really been very, mashallah, helpful, supportive. And Sister Delhi, I don't know if she's around and she can hear. But she has really been the backbone of a lot of work. You know, brothers and sisters, if you come tomorrow, we'll tell you the challenges we've had even marketing the event. Some of these newspapers, Spanish newspapers and so on, we've gone through challenges because when they look at Islam, some of them were asking us to change the whole marketing and take off, get to know the roots of your ancestors and all kinds of things. And we've really had to work hard even to come to Dallas to be able to pull off this event. So... Allah bless all these brothers and sisters who have really been working around for the last two days. Uh, personally, I slept two hours last night and three hours the night before. And alhamdulillah, coming over here is a ni'mah, it recharges. We don't even you know, feel it. But there's been a lot of work happening, mashallah, and coming to this community. And we hope to make the best out of it and share it everywhere. Barakallahu uh, feekum. Oh, okay. Sister wants to mention something? Yes. I just want to mention something real quick. Um, as a convert, you hear a lot, you're better than us, born Muslims. You're better than us, you chose that. Don't forget that you can also switch your life around. We're no better than anybody. We just had it very tough, and we had to find out through a very difficult way. Um, some, of, some by heartbreak, some of us by 
a lot of deception and a lot of us by, you know, gag members and stuff. So do not ever feel like we are better than you because we get more deeds or double the deeds or something. We just get double the deeds probably and Allah knows best because it's going to take us harder to figure it out. So do not ever think that you cannot switch your life around. Don't be a part-time Muslim. Please be a full-time Muslim. It makes a difference.